You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about what it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> Buckle your seatbelt. It's time for another episode of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including fish antibiotics, long-term storage food, water filters, bug out bags, and first aid kits. Use coupon code PREPPERRECON for 5% off your entire order at CampingSurvival.com. While you're at PrepperRecon.com, stop by the Prepper Recon Supply Store. We've got a great selection of Molly compression packs, hydration kits, and our new concealed carry tactical slings. All the packs and slings come with your choice of patch to let liberals know how you feel. We have some very cool Mulan Lay patches, Come and Take It patches, Sheepdog, Zombie Response Team, and Matching U.S. Flag patches. Of course, we still have our fully stocked Molly compatible individual first aid kits as well. Just click the store tab at the top of the PrepperRecon.com homepage. Today's guest is Mike Leister from TacticalWoodGas.com. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for uh, thanks for the invitation, and we're real happy to uh, to get the word out on on what we're doing and, and basically try to help some people out with their energy needs. Oh, absolutely! It's a it's a fantastic product that you're that you're offering. And, uh, you know, and I, I just think it's, it's great to have diversification no matter what you're doing, whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, your wealth preservation. I think it's great to diversify into, you know, uh, raw land and silver and gold. And if it's uh, if we're talking about energy production, I think it's great to diversify into uh, uh, solar. And I think wood gas is just that's that's great because uh, it's something that. Uh, most folks in, in America have access to wood, so I think it's a it's a fantastic thing that, that you're doing. Now, what a, initially got you into prepping? Well, you know, I guess a part of it is a little bit of DNA luck. Um, you know, I, you know, I grew up wanting to camp all the time. It was, you know, and I figured the scouts could give me that, and and so that was a, a great start to it. But in really in high school, there was a unusual uh, teacher uh, that had a civics class, and he. Threw up at the back in the old days. They didn't have computers. They just had these overhead projector things. And he threw up this chart of the national debt. And there's this little blip where it went down in 1950. And he says, "Well, but uh, that, that looks good. But it didn't actually happen. It was some accounting gimmickry that happened at the time." And I, I looked at that and I said, "Well, I don't really want to be an economics guy necessarily, but I can look at that and I can say that's going to end badly. If I, if I ran my life that way, at some point it was going to blow up bad." And so I figured, well, you know, I need to chart out a path where I'm making decisions, not, you know, in a panic hurry, but, you know, along the lines of, um, you know, every decision needs to be making, made from the standpoint of um, the, you know, what I've learned to be the artificially high level of prosperity that we have here, the artificially high standard of living that's afforded to us by our dollar, which, which we're abusing into the ground, you know, eventually that's going to go away. And so... I need to, you know, certain skills. I need certain um, preparations in order to get myself ready for that. Yeah, we've had f- hundreds of fiat currencies throughout time, and uh, they always end badly. <laughs> That's the one thing they all have in common. Yeah, up to a certain point, up to about 2000, it was more about skills. Um, and then uh, as my career started to really pick up traction in engineering, I had the ability to spend money on, on preps and, and put certain things away. Um and I'd reached a point where, uh, you know, some pretty smart people that I was listening to were, were saying, hey, this, uh, this economy, uh, this housing bubble is really a bubble, and uh, take a look at what un- uh, subprime loans are and, and CDOs and, and all of these uh, things. It's like, ah, I didn't want to learn economics, but uh, when a tidal wave is coming, you, you either learn how to swim, you know, or, or you drown. So um, I learned enough of that to say, okay, I need to, uh, you know, go into high gear. Um, and and had reached a certain point of food storage and, and metals and and you know defense and and I, I basically it's like all the big things that people panic and worry about. I went down my my list and I looked at you know my rotation. Everything was was pretty solid. And I thought um, you know really energy is my next thing to start worrying about. 
Um, and it was something that kind of, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was in Camp Lejeune in the, uh, gosh, it would have been the, uh, the late 80s. And they had, uh, unfortunately, some heavy metal toxic uh, chemicals in the water. Um, so the, the result years later was that diabetes raged up and bit me in the butt. Um, and for a short time, I was on that insulin. And uh, I looked at that and said, you know, without power, I'm going to die. How do I uh, get something that's going to be more and more, um, uh, make, that, make me immune to that uh, to the degree that I can? Now, fortunately, I had, you know, rigorous diet and, and you know, very strict uh, things like that got me off the insulin. But I figured, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, we take for granted. You know, a kilowatt hour of power, it, you know, is uh, less than a buck. But look what it will do for you. Um, you know, look at the security you'll provide, look at the lighting, look at the, you know, everything that, that happens because of power. It's such a big deal to to keep a, you know, basically to give you enough time to do other things that either, you, you know, you enjoy more um, or to, uh, you know, in a really tough time, it uh, gives you a comfortable, relatively comfortable living when, you know, everyone around you is struggling to uh, just to eat. So that, that's that's what got us into alternative energy, and and so we looked at it. And, and what I like and what I recommend to everyone is start out with a you know a decent sized battery bank. Um, in our case, you know we, you know me and my my brother in law Kelly, who uh, he's my lead fabricator at the business here. Um, we went with uh, you know golf cart batteries, but uh, those 12 volt deep cycle uh, marine batteries, um, uh, th those are pretty handy. Plus. Because you can use those as backups for your car. Um, you know, if you have a much smaller disaster, which is, you know, you need to get to work and your battery's dead, you could just swap out one of those batteries. Um, so anyway, we put together a battery bank with an inverter on it and, and went to our wives because we were both working uh, remotely um, and said if the freezer dies, uh, you know, if the power dies, uh, plug the freezer into this, turn this little switch on because we didn't want them having to pull on cords and and have, you know, the training of a, a startup sequence of a generator is, is more than we wanted to put on them during a power outage. Um, so we uh, we started with that, and then we went to, hey, we, we want a generator that uh, just puts out 12 volt, well, 13.8 volts and, and charges that directly and sips fuel. And then we looked at the amount of fuel we were storing. It's like, ugh, um, isn't there a better way to uh, to do this? You know, do, can we store a big, uh, just a monster pig, a propane pig and and you know, have power that way, but eventually that runs out too. So we said, well, old old technology sometimes is the best for certain circumstances. And so we uh, made a, a wood calf generator that is really, really clean, that'll uh, charge your batteries, uh, run your generator, um, and uh, it's small and light. It's, you're able to pick this thing up and bug out with it. Um, it's not something you need a forklift to uh, put onto a big trailer uh, if you need to relocate. It's something that'll fit in, you know. It'll fit in my little Jetta diesel when I'm running out to some of the local uh, locations to do demonstrations. It's time for a quick break, and we'll be right back. The dollar's lost over 90% of its purchasing power since 1971. Silver, on the other hand, has proved to be a very stable form of wealth preservation over the years. And where do you buy silver? Silver.com, of course. Silver.com offers fantastic prices on silver and gold. Check out Silver.com today. Now. Uh, what has you worried regarding grid power? Everything. There's so many things that are, are uh, put our, our power grid at risk. Um, one thing is, you know, even with the, the smart, you know, uh, uh, the way they've divided up the parts of the national grid, it's a one big grid. Um, you know, there's a political risk. So, you know, one of the things that uh, one of the, uh, the TV shows came out with, um, well, about a year ago, was that uh, last winter, no, six months ago, let, this last winter we were one power grid away from um, the whole eastern seaboard uh, having a, a blackout um, during the crazy cold weather that, uh, that we had over there. Um, basically, if, if one of those uh, um, power plants had gone off in the national grid, um, it would have shut that down. Um, and people would have died. A lot of people would have died in... in that kind of cold weather with no way to heat themselves. Um, and, and you add into that, the and, and that goes right into the political risk. Um, we've got, uh, you know, a, a political movement to shut down a lot of coal-fired power plants. Well, if we even just repeat last year's winter with one coal plant shut down, we're going to hit that scenario. We're going to hit the scenario where people are going to die because of, uh, of no power. 
in extremely cold weather. Um, and I think they're shutting, they're trying to shut down a lot of them. Uh, the next one is uh, maintenance. Um, you take a look. There's there's a program I was on five six years ago that said, hey, take a look at the the national transportation infrastructure and and they went and they basically surveyed the country and, and said, look at all these things that are about to fall apart. And that was about a year before that big bridge up in, was it Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, you know, basically fell down. Uh, up here in Washington on the, uh, on the west side, um, a uh, truck was a, you know, loaded a little too high and it banged into the bridge, uh, a metal uh, uh, bridge, and, and the whole thing sank. It basically fell straight into uh, the Snohomish River. Tilaguanch River. Anyway, um, uh, bridges are falling into rivers <laughs> just from uh, maintenance, and I think the power grid's the same way. Um, you know, com companies um, will maintain things um, um, as best they can within their budgets, but uh, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff to maintain, and I think a lot of it is is uh, kept you know just barely uh, maintained enough. Um, and then the next thing is sabotage. Is is the the grid is strung across the whole country. You know, one guy with a rifle uh, picking off insulators um, can, it can cause a lot of trouble. Um, in was it California somewhere? Uh, they found that uh, a group of uh, three or four people had gone up above a uh, uh, substation and were, were doing a you know basically a rifle attack on some of the uh, the gener the uh, transformers on that location. Um, fortunately, they didn't accumulate enough damage into the generators to get the thing to blow up. Um, but, you know, that was maybe a practice run. Maybe they'll come back next time with, uh, you know, a, a Barrett Light 50 and uh, take it out in four or five rounds. So then there's the EMP, you know, and that's a standard one. You know, they're, there's, they're getting nukes uh, fine-tuned for maximum EMP uh, creation. Um, and if, from a radio, you know, frequency standpoint, the, our national power grid, all these wires going to wear giant antennas to pick up that energy and, and just blow up transformers. So, you know, there's the solar uh, coronal mass ejection. Um, and then there's just human error. You know, there's, I was down in San Diego probably three, four years ago for a while. And uh, a guy in Arizona was changing a, uh, um, a fuse uh, on one of the big uh, uh, switching stations, transfer stations. Um, and that took out power to, you know, basically from south of, of Los Angeles all the way down into Mexico and uh, east all the way, like, halfway through uh, um, New Mexico. Um, so just, you know, you know human error uh, can bring uh, a power grid down in, in a pretty inconvenient time. And you, you, so mentioned, lots, lots <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned sabotage, but... Uh, uh, Janet, Janet Napolitano on her exit speech when uh, when she left DHS uh, said that a cyber attack was basically imminent and uh, and that uh, it's something that we should expect uh, in the near future. I guess it was about two weeks ago that J.P. Morgan was hacked by uh, possibly uh, sovereign actors, uh, possibly uh, Russia. Yeah. Well, uh, yes. The it's you know hackers started out as you know thrill seekers, and then they, you know, uh, when the criminals realized there was profit in it, then it became a profit uh, deal. Now it's a, uh, now it's a, it's a, just another tool in the in the warfare uh, box, you know, and, and governments are, are pulling that out and they're using it. Um, there's, uh, you know, I can't remember where I read this, but it was along the lines of billions of dollars are hacked out of the major banks in the U.S. And uh, I've seen some things where it's like, hey, my account, this can't be right. And the next day it's fixed. Um, and uh, when I when I read that uh, report, I thought, oh, um, so basically they're they're putting the money back in because if uh, everyone that the bank is putting the money back in and just taking those losses because the uh, um, if everyone knew that how vulnerable the bank accounts were, they wouldn't keep any money in there, and then the, the capital ratios of the banks would be turned upside down. Then we'd have another big. Uh, Run of the banks and, and uh, another, you know, 2008, 2009, um, you know, all the banks are going to die. Now let's, you know, give them another 10 billion or trillion dollars. So, yeah, it's a crazy world. Can you explain to us, uh, in, in sort of in layman's terms, how gasification works? Okay. So, any kind of a carbureted engine that normally runs on gasoline can be converted to run on wood gas. Um, and, and so, the normally 
it takes uh, gasoline in from the tank and it turns it into gas vapors, um, and that, that's what goes into the engine and, and burns. And so what we're providing is uh, hydrogen, methane, lithium uh, gases that burn um, just as good as, as gasoline vapors, um, but uh, don't come out of a gas can. They come out of wood or uh, dried animal dung or you know basically anything that you could you know pile up and burn like a campfire. Um, you can use for this. And and how this thing works uh, in the olden days, you'd uh, seal up a can of wood with a hose coming out of it, and you just light a campfire underneath it. And it would heat up the wood, and, and the gas would be cooked out of the wood and go out that pipe, and, and you'd cool it down and filter it and run your engine. Um, and the you know that's great, and it's really simple. Um, the problem with it is that you eventually you've expended all of the gas out of that, and you're left with just basically a bunch of charcoal that won't burn. Um, and you've got to let the thing cool down. You've got to clean it out. And, and if you're running a vehicle on it, or you're running something that is, you know, mission critical for for anything, um, that's a, a tough thing to work around. So they uh, later on they invented, uh, they upgraded to uh, a, a constant fueling um, method called a, a downdraft gas fire. Um, in that case, the the wood that you're burning for heat, and the wood that you're cooking the gas out of, all go in the same chamber. And, and for us, we call that the reactor uh, stage of, of the generator, of the gas fire. So you, you know, little wood from like, uh, from wood pellet, um, for pellet stoves, from as small as that up to, you know, we recommend up to about maybe an inch. Um, we say smaller than a golf ball. Uh, chunked up wood. So not big logs, but chunked up wood. And you fill the hopper full. Um, and you put the lid on. And there's a little ignition port that lets you light that wood at the very, very bottom of the pile. Uh, you get that lit, and you use a fan to, you know, make it go faster, to basically get a, a big enough burn area in there. Close off that ignition port, and you use the fan to push the, uh, the gas through the system. Initially, you're not creating wood gas. You, well, you're creating a little bit of wood gas, but you're mostly creating smoke. But as you use the fan to push that air down through that uh, burn area, and through at the bottom of the bur the reactor, there's a holes with a grill to keep the uh, the, the wood from falling through and just lets the gas through. Um, it passes through there and and on onto the rest of the system. So the oxygen coming in causes that fire to grow up to a certain size, and the limit of that is is the point at which you're using up all of the oxygen. There's nothing left. So the fire would like to get big enough to like burn all the wood all at one time, but there's not enough oxygen for that. So the fire stays at the bottom, and it uh, it cooks the wood above it. That uh, methane, uh, um, uh, hydrogen, CO goes through the, the fire area, the, the burn area, without burning because there's no oxygen to bind with it to burn. Um, and then, we, uh, then we've got wood gas, but it's dirty wood gas. So the next thing we do is we extract the tars. And the most efficient way to extract tars is to condense them out of the air. So what we do is we uh, put that through the next stage, and that's a um, it's a water jacketed heat exchanger. So you know, think of a kind of like an inside-out radiator. You're you're putting the gas through the radiator, and you're surrounding it with water, um, and it uh, transfers the heat into the water. And as that gas cools, uh, the the you know any water vapor and all of the tar condense against the walls and flow downhill uh, into a, a tar trap, a catch jar that we have. At that point, you've, you've removed the, uh, the tar, which would you know, very quickly stop your engine from running. So that's a real important stage. The next stage is the, the final stage is the particle filter. And that's a, a three-stage filter. Um, and uh, you know, they, we don't ship them full of the media because it, it's just common stuff you buy at the hardware store. The, the bottom layer of, uh, of the filter media is fiberglass insulation like you put in your roof. Um, and then the, that's the bottom third. The next, the middle third is uh, um, not vermiculite, but the uh, perlite. perlite. Um, it's a expanded volcanic glass that uh, absorbs water um, uh, really well. But the middle is, is perlite. And then the top layer is uh, any kind of a very furry shredded material, like a reasonably fine sawdust. But the best thing we found as far as something easy to put away is uh, 
that paper-based uh, pet bedding they sell at PetSmart and other places. It's basically, paper pet bedding for gerbils and, and, and those kinds of small animals um, are very furry and catch all the little particles awesome. You could make do with things like shredded toilet paper or, you know, anything that has Little fine furry, uh, uh, you know, not 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 ripped up uh, newspaper, but you know something furry. Um, and at that point, you're ready to uh, mix it 50/50 with uh, regular outside air, and your engine will run on that. So, hopefully, that was simple enough. Ah, very cool, very cool. Um, now, why is tactical part of your company name? Well, uh, my my philosophy is is. You know, I want to take I, – I, I put money, I put uh, work into uh, these designs. I want to be able to take it with me if I have to bug out. There's, you know, here in, in uh, the Spokane, uh, Washington area, it's been a pretty crazy uh, weather pattern. Um, June 22nd and then two more times within the next two weeks, uh, we had tornadoes, uh, which, we, you know, I, I initially said, hey, we never have those. But then I looked it up and it's like, well, there have been some. It's just, you know. You know, we'll, over the whole history of Washington's recorded weather, there's maybe, uh, you know, 15 uh, tornadoes um, where, you know, some states will have that in one season. So it's just in, in living memory, um, you know, we're not used to these things. And they were knocking down power poles. They were knocking trees into houses, all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, we had a, a pretty bad fire season. Um, we had a, a kind of a wet spring um, they stayed a little cooler, and, and plants grew. Basically, the the, uh, the stuff that dries out becomes the fuel for the fires was twice as much as it used to be. So we had a lot of fires. We had a lot of things, um, you know, that would cause you to have to bug out. And so we said, let's design this in such a way that, uh, you know, this whole system will fit. You know, like I said, when I'm when I'm running over to do a little local demo, hope in and, and I want to, you know, I you know I like driving my truck, but. I like uh, 45 miles per gallon on my little diesel car, so I'll just put all that in the back seat of the car and uh, run it out for a demo, and then bring it back. So you don't need if you have to bug out, uh, it'll fit in a you know a small area, um, and uh, you know I like that aspect of it. And we're gonna put a picture up of your your big dragon. It, we're going to have that in the show notes today so people can go over to uh, PrepperRecon.com and look at that. And, of course, that will link over to, to your site for folks to be able to buy that. Now, even even the Big Dragon, which is your most expensive unit, still comes in at under $1,000. I think that's pretty reasonable. Oh, it is. Uh, initially, because, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I've got, you know, I've got a little bit of extra, you know, money at the end of the month. And I went to one of these prepper shows uh, some time ago um, and said, hey, I'll, you know, I got a book. Boy, that's a lot to figure out. Uh, let me just go buy one and get started and then see what happens. And I couldn't find anything less than like $25,000. So basically, I, you know, and I think uh, there was uh, more recently I found one for like four or $5,000. These are beyond the, the range of most everyone. And it was way beyond what I was willing to uh, to put into it. Um, and so we thought, you know, we can we find a way to just crush the price on this to to get it down to where, you know, uh, you know, a person um, could, uh, you know, add it into the budget, uh, you know, set aside, you know, in a in a you know reasonable way and and get the thing real relatively quick. Um, and uh, you know, from the standpoint of uh, you know having a generator, having, you know, in our case, uh, we slaughter uh, hogs and cattle and. We make our own ham and bacon and, and uh, summer sausage and and uh, you know so between uh, you know the, the multiple families that uh, they are involved with this we have you know ten thousand dollars or more of meat uh, set aside in freezers that are designed to last a whole year. So you know if you got ten thousand dollars of meat protected by one thousand dollars of uh, of uh, wood gas, um, <clears throat> as far as being able to you know run a long time without uh, ever letting your freezer stop. Um, that's a pretty wise investment, and then you, you know, it does it, you know, that that pays for itself. I think uh, the first time you have a power, a long power outage where you, you know, you use it, um, and then everything after that is just, you know, uh, keeping the brooder lights on for the for the baby chicks so they don't die um, during uh, certain parts of the year. Um, having a fan in the window when it's 100 degrees out, um, and 
you know, the, the sun has gone down, you're trying to cool down the house. Um, there's a, just a thousand different ways in which, you know, you add up all the little uh, uh, improvements in your, your life experience based on, you know, having something like this that uh, um, is there and, and easy to use. You know, from, it, I think it's uh, definitely worth the money. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, people are pretty excited about it. We're actually at this point, uh, you know, barely keeping up with orders. Um, we've got a new uh, shop that we're building. We're, we're trying to get the roof on and, and waterproof before the rains start in the fall. So um, we're uh, really excited to, uh, to pick this up and, and uh, um, grow it through the winter. And then you also sell generators, but you mentioned earlier that, uh, that you could run just about any generator off this. But the ones that you have, are they already adapted to just uh, accept the, the hose from the, the wood gasifier? Yeah, yeah. Early on, I I had made the assumption. You know how it is. You you assume that everyone's kind of like you a little bit. Um, and so if I understood it, then other people did. Um, and they looked at it and they just you know, with words, telling someone how to modify a carburetor, how to uh, how to mix the gas, um, wasn't working. And so we thought, well, let me just build a, an example. We'll bring it to one of the shows and we'll show them how. Hey, just copy this. And uh, you know, it's like right away, it's like oh. I just sold that generator, <laughs> and I put I, I put a price on it. It's like you know I thought oh this is too high of a price, um, but uh, no, uh, people are looking for something that is tried and true. Uh, hook it all together and it works. Um, and uh, one nice thing about it is you you get a generator that's a pretty small form factor. Um, that is uh, you know it's it's set up to run uh, wood gas, but it'll also run propane and and uh, natural gas if you need to. Um, and and people do like buying something. Hey, this this thing end to end come from from one place. If I need customer support, um, I don't have to mix up my generator guy with my wood gas guy. I've got one guy to call and say, Hey, um, I'm having uh, I'm, I'm confused about something. Help help me run through the startup and and uh, routine of the of the system. Yeah, that's great because uh, there's a lot of people out there that are like me. And when it comes to you know being mechanically inclined. Um, if you're talking about turning on and off a light switch, I'm really good at that. But uh, beyond that, I, I really start getting lost easy. So uh, so that's great. Um, now, give us an idea how many things we could run off of the Big Dragon and the 6.5 horsepower generator. Okay. So it's, uh, you know, ideally you're running the thing with uh, with a battery bank. You're charging a battery bank with this um, and an inverter powering thing. So. What, with us and our four um, um, uh, golf cart batteries, or they could be four just a 12 volt deep cycle marine. Um, we, we on the power outage we had on uh, the first tornado, um, we uh, it was gosh it was hot it was like nearly 100 degrees and and we watched the temperatures of the of the freezer was going up fast, so we uh, we immediately hooked up to uh, to that and we were able to run that about 12 hours but uh, and it took about uh, two and a half hours uh, with this gas fire and generator to recharge that battery bank. Um, so, um, and that was with, let's see, three deep uh, chest freezers. So three three big full-size freezers and two refrigerators. Um, uh, and that, you know, say twice a day. So that's about four hours of running a day. Uh, kept three freezers and two refrigerators um, running constantly. Um, and you could be less conservative than that. You could, you could, uh, you know, you don't have to have it plugged in all the time. You can, you can let it, you can, you know, get it to a deep freeze and then let it coast, you know, with it for a little while. So you could cut that in half. But if you wanted to, you know, be, you know, say you got medicines or you got things that really have to stay frozen. Um, so, you know, with that system, um, you know, it's it's not a whole house generator, um, and the 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 wants versus the needs, you're going to have to, you got to figure out what you really need. But, you know, three freezers and two fridges is an awful lot of need covered. Um, uh, and most people don't have that uh, that much um, need. If you've got more than that, then then you probably want to have someone dedicated to, you know, doing four or five, six hours of, uh, of generator run a day uh, with this to keep up with it. So, we, you know, and that was a, that was a homestead um, with uh, we didn't stop manufacturing during that phase. So there's a homestead plus a small business that uh, was run on wood gas um, with that generator and that gas fire. 
Very cool. Very cool. Now, can you tell the folks uh, where they can find your site if they'd like to purchase one of these? We're going to have links, but uh, we've got folks listening on YouTube and Stitcher that may not actually be at the site to, to click through. So uh, let those folks well, know where they can find you. Okay. Um, our website is tacticalwoodgas.com. Um, you can get to me, Mike, at tacticalwoodgas.com, or you can get to uh, Kelly Sales at tacticalwoodgas.com. Uh, we've got a Facebook page, so if you just if you go to Facebook and you just search on Tactical Wood Gas, you'll find us, and you'll see the the progress we're making on the the uh, the pool building out back. And um, there's one thing we haven't talked about is is the we've got some pictures of the garden in there. Since we started doing this, we uh, one of the byproducts of this system is uh, biochar. So the the wood uh, at the, the fire at the bottom cooking the wood above it uh, turns that into biochar. And uh, for us, we looked at it and said, well, that's probably good in the garden. We just throw it in the garden. Um, and uh, we started doing that last fall. Uh, this year, what normally are 10-pound uh, um, uh, pumpkins are, are 40 pounds. Um, we, our, our tomatoes just blew up. We have no idea what to do with all these tomatoes. Our, our, uh, all the squash, basically, um, for free, as a as a natural byproduct, you get uh, uh, biochar. So that you'll find that stuff on uh, Facebook, and then we've got an 800 number, 800-516-4249, um, and then we also have a YouTube channel if you look up Tactical Wood Guest. Very cool, Mike. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. Um, we're trying to help people out, so uh, give us a call if we can help you with the power needs. Detroit High Priority 911 calls average 58 minutes for a response. How much longer will it be until budget cuts, natural disaster, or a total collapse make you responsible for your own security? The new book, Retreat Security and Small Unit Tactics by David Kobler and Mark Goodwin, will teach you how to organize your team or neighborhood into a force to be reckoned with. You'll get tips to harden your home and protect your family, life, and property, both now and after the stuff hits the fan. Retreat Security and Small Unit Tactics is available in paperback, Kindle, and audio editions. Buy it from Amazon.com before it's too late.